Again, uh, good morning and welcome to this class. For some reason, uh, I know we still have about, what, uh, less than two weeks before spring break starts. So I'm hoping that uh, we will hang on until then because we will have another exam also coming. And uh, there was a question actually before the recording and I answered that in a sense that I did not analyze the data yet to see what average is and things like that. And usually after uh, each exam, I review the answers for individual uh, questions, basically student by student, to make sure that the student get the full credit for it. And sometimes they actually get partial credit if uh, the reasoning is close enough on the answer. So that is something that I uh, need to do. And uh, today is chapter, I forgot the number, but it has to do with sound, okay? Today's chapter, uh, today is on sound and I have the power, it's chapter 10, okay? waves and sound. So uh, if you guys, uh, I mean, um, I know we have to finish this. It's a quite a few slides. So let's go through them. Okay, so let's start uh, sharing the screen. So uh, there are two phenomena that you really have to make a distinction between the two. There is an oscillation like this one, for example, if I put a mass in here, you can imagine that this will go up and down. I tried earlier with another spring in here and I couldn't find a mass large enough for it to cause it to oscillate, but I'm sure that you're familiar with this phenomenon. So this is a vibration or oscillation. Basically what it is in this case is it's happening in a local place, it doesn't travel, okay? I don't worry about the, the, the disturbance traveling along the string. What I'm worried about in here is a mass suspended in here going up and down. A pendulum also is an example of, a, of an oscillation. So if you put a mass in here, it's going to go from maximum angle back to equilibrium position, then to a minimum angle, then back to equilibrium position. And supposedly it can go forever unless there is friction, of course. So this is a case of vibration or oscillation. A wave on the other hand requires a medium to travel in. Like for example, if I take this slinky, I can create a disturbance up and down. The disturbance is created only from one side, from this, my right-hand side, but it's traveling all the way to the other side, actually. And uh, this is transverse wave. Also, what I could do with a sling, slinky in this case is actually create a disturbance on one side by compressing the, the slinky and let go. What you will notice is that these compressions will travel along back and forth. So this is actually another wave, but it's actually a compressional wave. So there are two types, two main kinds of waves. There is transverse waves. They go up and down and the wave is traveling left, right, for example, where the disturbance is perpendicular to the direction of travel versus longitudinal waves or compressional waves where the disturbance and the, and the direction of travel are the same. So in this case, we call them longitudinal or, 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 or uh, transverse waves. So I really want you to make that distinction between three, between three different concepts that needs to be done, done today. And that is the item of the discussion. So the item one is the difference between a vibration and a wave, okay? This one is local, this one travels. Case in point, sound, for example, travels. It, it leaves the source and goes through the medium and reaches the, the, the receiver, in this case, the, the microphone of, the, of, the, of, the, of this computer. Then it's converted actually to an electrical signal. The electrical signal goes in here, goes through the wire, which is actually an electrical signal that, at that point, it's not a wave anymore. Then after that, it comes through another uh, 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 source from your end, which is the speaker and travels throughout the entire medium, even if you move back, you're going to still hear the sound and the intensity of the sound, of course, starts to drop because it's spreading over bigger and bigger areas. As a matter of fact, if you go very far away, the intensity will be so weak at that point, you cannot hear sound. So this is basically the biggest difference between the two. A wave is a disturbance. Both of them are disturbances, actually. So it's a disturbance. So if I take, for example, the slinky, where was it? Where did I put it? I lost it. 
or a string for that matter, it doesn't matter, okay? If you take string, I have a string in here that is type, but it's still a string nonetheless. Okay, so this is a string. At this point, there is no wave unless I create a disturbance along its, its side. In this case, it's going to travel. If I take a mass, for example, oh, here is a string key. If I take a mass in here and suspend it with a string, and if I don't do anything to it, it's going to stay vertical. This is a position of equilibrium. But if I disturb it out of its equilibrium, now there is oscillation or vibrations, and these vibrations are outside, basically in and out of the equilibrium. So both of them require disturbance, whether a wave or a, a, a disturbance, or, I mean, uh, or a vibration or an oscillation. So sometimes you hear me use the word oscillation a lot for vibrations, because they are the same. OK? So it's a disturbance. So you have something in equilibrium that is stationary, that is not going anywhere. So if you take a slinky, for example, and you let go of it, it's going to reach some sort of an equilibrium, and it's not going to do anything after that. Now you're going to disturb it from that equilibrium, and now all of a sudden there are either oscillations or waves, one of the two. The only difference between the two now is one of them stays in its place, the other one changes location. So that is one distinction I want you to make clear. The other one is transverse versus longitudinal or sometimes called co uh, compressional wave, okay? So the first one is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So this is where the wave wants to go. So what it does in this case, it's perpendicular to it. So it's up and down with respect to that one. So this disturbance is at any given point going up and down versus where it's going, where it's direction of travel. Example like that, for example, the waves on a string is a good example of that. Light actually is also a wave. We're going to see that next chapter. And that too is perpendicular to the direction of travel. Okay. And uh, there are all kinds of waves. Like, for example, uh, seismic waves, they come up with two different flavors. One of them is actually longitudinal, and one of them actually is compressional. Both of them, they occur in there. Longitudinal waves, the good example of that is actually the slinky. Actually, the slinky can do both, too. So the slinky can be uh, up and down, but also it can be uh, compressional. So the slinky also is a good example of that. And uh, sound. OK? So again, in the case of uh, the compressional waves or longitudinal waves, what's going on in this case, you have disturbance that is back and forth in the same direction of the direction of propagation. So in this case, the disturbance and the direction of propagation, they are in the same direction. So that is really the difference between the two. We're going to explore sound after that as a wave, which is really the other half of this chapter, because this chapter is about waves and sound. And one property of all waves that it does, and that is reflection and refraction. So what is the difference between the two? If you stand in front of the mirror and you look at the mirror, here is you, you will see another you on the other side that is not real. It's actually virtual. I mean, if you go behind the mirror, you're not going to see anybody on the other side. I hope you know that by now. If not, check, OK? There is nobody behind the, the mirror. It's only a reflection of your image, which is really when you look at your hand, you're going to see it as if it's here, OK? But it's actually coming from this reflection. If you look at your foot, for example, the back one, you're going to see it as if it's coming from here. Again, you're making an image of yourself just by looking at these reflections, OK? So we're going to explore the law of reflection. The law of refraction requires two media, for example, you have uh, water and you have uh, air. When you look at an object under the water, the object light is actually refracted so that it appears to be here, but it's actually here. Because light travels at different speeds between air and, and, uh, and water. So in this case, light and there goes what is known as a refraction or breaking down, basically, when it goes through between the tra transition of two media. So that is usually, and it's used actually in lenses also. Lens is made out of a material that has a very high refractive index. And in that case, light, when it goes, it's actually bent 
and you can use a, a lens to converge light to a specific location like the ones that we use for our glasses because we don't see well because the image is not forming on a retina so we use corrective uh, lenses to bring the image to focus into the retina so that your brain basically interpret the image sharply better than the fuzzy one that is producing an image before the retina or after the retina, whether you have a short eye or a long eye, depending on what the image correction needs to be. For that, you need to have lenses that bring the image back. If you have a, a, a short eye in this case, so it brings it back. So you need converging lenses actually, and or diverging lenses. Did I say it backward? I think I said it backward. Diver uh, uh, conver uh, converging lenses to bring it forward and diverging lenses to push it back because the image is actually uh, not falling in the right place anyway. So you have to have the two types in this case, depending on what kind of corrective lenses you need. So it's used extensively, not just for lenses, but actually for microscopes, telescopes, everywhere. So this, this phenomenon of reflection and refraction, both of them are used in optics, really, for light, but also for sound too, for any wave, actually, they do that. For any kind of wave, they have this behavior. Then we're going to talk about the phenomenon of resonance because any oscillation or vibration or wave can be sustained by an external force. So it can be forced. And that force can lead to phenomena associated with resonance, for example, can cause problems. So we're going to talk about that. Or it can be a plus, actually. You need resonance, for example, to excite certain, certain molecules to see if they exist or not. So resonance is an important phenomenon. Resonance is used actually in tuning of radio, tuning of all kinds of devices. So waves are important for a lot of reasons, not just for lenses and sound and things like that, but also for telecommunications. Your phone would not work if it does not receive signal and send signal to the tower. And basically, it needs to be in sync and resonance with the uh, sending and the uh, receiving end to be able to amplify the signal and work with it. So this is basically uh, one thing. The other thing is signature of waves is interference. If I have two disturbances, one is up and one is down, and one is traveling this way and the other one is traveling that way, when they meet, they cancel each other. So we call this one destructive interference. If I have two disturbances, one like this and another one like that, and let's say, for example, they're traveling opposite to one another, when they reach this point, there will be actually a higher. So in this case, we have constructive interference. Interference is unique to waves. If you have two balls, okay, and you throw them against one another, they don't disappear. No matter what happened, you still have two distinguishable particles in this case. So particles do not do interference. So if you see interference, you know you're dealing with waves. So this is the signature of a wave. How do we recognize a wave? If it exhibits interference, okay? We're gonna talk about the Doppler effect and the Doppler effect is basically the increase or the decrease of a frequency apparently due to the motion of the source or the motion of the listener or both. So as you're approaching the source or as the source is approaching you or as both of you are approaching the source or even if you're receding from the source but the, uh, the source is approaching you faster or even if the, fast, uh, the resource is receding from you but you're approaching the, uh, the, the source faster of sound or any way for that matter, you will hear that the frequency is has a higher pitch. Okay, and you can tell even if you have a blindfold for sound, for example, that you're approaching from the source or the source is approaching from you. A siren, for example, from an emergency vehicle, you can tell if it's coming to you or not, if it's getting closer or further away, just by listening to sound. You don't have to see it. Just by listening to sound, you can tell if it's cl closing, closing, by, closing on you or no. So this is what the Doppler effect is. The opposite of the side is if it's receding from you, meaning it's you are moving away and it's moving away, or you're moving away and it's coming closer, but it's not in the same, you're moving more than it's coming away, or it's, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're moving away sl uh, slower, or should I say, faster than it's approaching you or slower than it's receding from you or something like that. So the combination of if you have basically are, it's moving away, the result of it is it's going to be a lower pitch that you can tell just by listening to sound, okay? This is not true only for sound, true for everything. True for all kinds of waves, they do that. And this is really what led us to 
the conclusion that the universe is expanding is just by looking at the light coming from the far away galaxies and that light seems to be shifted to the red, not to the blue, to the longer wavelength, not to the shorter wavelength, to the pitch that seems to be lower, not to the pitch that seems to be higher. So that means every which way we look, everything is receding from us. That means that the universe is expanding. So this is really how we discovered that using the Doppler effect. Bow waves and the sonic boom is something that we're going to explore. This is very hard to do with light, although it's doable in nuclear reactors, for example, but with sound, you can see that. If the source is moving super fast, faster than the speed of sound, so the source sends a wave and moves. Before the wave reaches you, it sends another wave and another wave and another wave, depending on how fast it's moving. In this case, what happened is you will, he, you will see that accumulation of those wave fronts as they pile up, by the time they reach you, they will have a very high intensity that can yank your ear out of its location, basically the eardrum, move it in and out so violently that it's, you hear it as a boom, as a very loud sound, okay? So that is basically the pileup of those, those wave fronts as the plane is moving, that really can cause that. Okay. The source in general, even a super fast supersonic bullet can do that. Okay, uh, and it happens also on the ocean when the when the when the when the boats are moving too fast compared to the wave with the speed of the waves on the surface of the water. So that is basically why we call them boom waves. And finally, we're going to talk about musical instruments. And um, I have here my gears. I brought my instrument, uh, my musical instruments in here to play a number with you guys because we can talk about vibrations and oscillations. So I think I know waves perfectly that you're going to hear the best musical number ever. Okay. So much so that some of my students, when they heard it for the first time, they had tears in their eyes. So I'm hoping some of you will have that same reaction at the end. Okay. Sounds promising, doesn't it? Yes? Or no? You guys don't care about music? Anybody? Well, I have never had a class that doesn't like music. This is strange. OK, then I probably will not play the number for you guys, because probably you don't appreciate this kind of music. Anyway. I would want to have a vote in here. I want to see who wants to uh, hear the music or not. No? Nobody? OK. I see a thumbs up, but I don't understand. If you mean you don't want to hear it, that's fine. OK? I will play it for another class. <laughs> anyway, so let's get going, OK? So vibrations are a wiggle in time. And that is basically, in a nutshell, what that is. Whether, for example, you take a mass and you attach to a spring and you cause this, the mass to go up and down. In this case, so this is actually a wiggle or a disturbance in time. So that is basically what it is. So it's going up and down. And if you wait, for example, a whole cycle, it's going to repeat. So this is a repetitive, a repetitive motion. I mean, I drew it this way, but uh, for example, if I take a pendulum and attach a mass to it and disturb the mass out of its equilibrium and let go of it, it's going to oscillate back and forth, okay? And if I wait a certain amount of time, a cycle actually, this action is repeated time and time again, okay? So this is, depends on time. And this one also depends on time. And both of them are examples of a disturbance, okay? Wave, on the other hand, is a wiggle in space and time that transports energy. Why is this on front in here? Okay. So this is basically what a, uh... oh man, I know why it was in. Okay, let's make it smaller then. Anyway, so uh, so disturbance in space and time, for example, if you take string, a very long string in here, okay, 
somewhere at infinity, it's, uh, somebody is holding it from the other side, and it creates a disturbance in here. So you're going to move the string up and down and let go of it. So what you will notice is that this disturbance, after a while, it's going to be here, actually. And after a while, it's going to be all the way there. So I say in this case is that this disturbance is traveling to the right. All you have to do is jink it up and down. You don't have to go up and down, left and right all the time, okay, just once. So what you did in this case, you created disturbance. The shape and the value and everything else, if there is no friction, everything else will travel from this location, which is really disturbance in time now because it's going up and down. So this point in here, that was here, okay? Now, at some point, it's going to rise up and come back again. So this point in here, or this point in here that was actually here, went through that already. So this point went up and down, and now it's back to its own uh, equilibrium position where it was before. So every single point, the point that was here now is actually here now, if I follow it, okay? So it's actually has been impacted by that one. And the same thing point that was in here, now actually after a while. So this is after a few seconds, this is after longer than that, and this one is actually happening a little later. So this is immediately after the disturbance. So I can call this one t equal to zero. This one is t sometime, let's say for example, after 10 seconds. And if I wait after 20 seconds, it's gonna be here, okay? So this is the shape of the, of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the string. So what I'm saying in here is that take a picture, take a camera with you and take pictures of intervals, for example, of 10 seconds and you will see is changing, is moving along, okay? Whereas this one, if you take a camera and you take pictures, you're going to find that the disturbance here is happening in time and here you can take several pictures, but it's going to repeat in the same location, okay? In the same location, okay? So this is basically the difference between the two. A wave is characterized by few parameters, okay? Uh, if it's traveling in space, so this is this is a harmonic wave, by the way, okay? So when you see something like this one, it's a harmonic wave. Okay, Tim wants to hear the music, but unfortunately, you're the only one by yourself now. So maybe some other time, okay? Nobody else cares about music in this class. Or maybe, we'll see, okay? <laughs> we'll see. I'm telling you guys, I know music because I know harmonics and I know waves and I know oscillations and vibrations. So I'm promising the best music. <laughs> okay. You know where this is headed, okay? It's headed for a disaster. Okay, so that you can <laughs> some some artist starts to talk to you about musical numbers and starts to use frequency and wavelengths. That's when you suspect that that guy has no knowledge whatsoever about art and music. So we'll see. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, so with the characteristic of a wave, this is ca called the harmonic wave. Actually, a harmonic waves is the one that repeats periodically in this fashion. Okay, like a sine wave function or a cosine wave function. So this is where the amplitude has this uniform behavior. We call a period or a wavelength in this case is the repetition of the pattern over a certain distance. Because this is, if I take a picture, for example, of the ocean and I see the surface waves as they are moving in there, this is more or less the shape I see. So this is how the surface wave in here look like. So there is a hump in here where the water is piling up in that place. There is a lack thereof below actually the surface. Then there is another one and there is this one in here. So if I'm looking at the surface waves, and of course this is coming from very far away from the ocean. And by the time it hits the, the, uh, the shore of the, uh, the shoreline in this case is going to die out because there is not much surface in that case, okay? So in this case, this pattern in here, if I take a picture of it in here from where it repeats completely, then in this case, I say this is actually a wavelength. I can actually measure it, okay? If I have a sense of how far the place is and using geometry, I can find this one. So this is the wavelength. This is how long it is. Each unit is repeating after that. So if you say, for example, you know what? How about this point to this point? That's gonna be the same distance. It's the same wavelength, okay? And the wavelength is actually measured in units of distance which is a meter, 
okay? So this is basically what it is. It's a distance between two uh, peaks or two uh, minima, okay? Or any points that resemble each other, okay? In this point, for example, the wave is coming from, uh, from a high peak. This one is actually rising. So this one is not a wavelength. This is actually not a wavelength. But this one is coming down again in the same fashion because this one repeats. No, this one doesn't because the next one doesn't look like this one. It looks actually uh, uh, the opposite way. So in this case, this is the whole thing is actually a wavelength. So this is the same distance measured in meters. So the wavelength is an important measure of the wave. In addition to that, the amplitude, how strong the wave is. Okay, obviously that's what the weatherman gives you on the, the ocean waves, basically, how much the how much they rise up and down, okay? And that tells you the intensity of the wave. Really, the intensity is proportional to the amplitude, usually not exactly the amplitude, but the square of the amplitude. So if you double the wave amplitude, you quadruple the intensity of the wave. It becomes far more damaging than a simple wave, which is less, okay? So that is an important point in here related to waves. In addition to that, there is that temporal behavior in time. So the crest and the trough are the, the trough and the ones that I was describing earlier. Okay, those are the high points and the low points. Uh, the amplitude is halfway. Okay, the distance between here, between a crest and a trough, is twice the amplitude. This is twice this number, the amplitude. The amplitude is just from the equilibrium to up to a maximum. That is what your amplitude is. So again, we talked about that. The distance between two, between adjacent peaks in the direction of travel is of course, this is a distance, it cannot be frequency, it cannot be period, it cannot be amplitude. It is actually the wavelength. That is the only distance between adjacent peaks. So there is a peak in here and there is another peak in here. So somewhere there was a minimum in here. So this distance and this distance is what we're talking about. And that is exactly what wavelength is. If you are reading this stuff somewhere else and you encounter symbols, mathematical symbols, and you have no idea what that mathematical symbol, you have to remember this is the symbol that is used by physicists and the textbooks and everything else. So this is the symbol for the wavelength. It's the Greek letter lambda. So that you're not scared from that symbol. So when you see it, don't panic. It really means just the wavelength, the distance between two peaks or two crests or two troughs or two similar points on the wave. It's the same thing. And it's a distance in meters, okay? So that is what the wavelength is. So a vibration is described by frequency. Frequency is how often basically the, the, the oscillations go up and down or left and right or whichever behavior is in one second. So it could do one vibration in one second or two vibrations in one second or three vibrations in one second or Many, 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 many vibrations in one second. Usually your phone is of the order of five gigahertz, okay? Two gigahertz, one gigahertz. It's a gigahertz, which is 10 to the power nine oscillations in one second, okay? So that's a billion oscillations in one second. I mean, if I try to do it with my hand, I will not be able to. So this is not even hardly 20. Okay, and you're supposed to do a billion of them. That is really how the signal telecommunications is super fast because it involves light actually, the radio waves which are super fast. Okay, so this is the 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 the, the, the vibration. Also, so this is one of them because it's temporal behavior. Waves also has the same concept. So a wave has this frequency, but in addition to that, it has speed too and the wavelength. The wavelength is unique to waves. You don't have it in, 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 in vibrations. 
speed, you can't really talk about speed in here because it doesn't travel, it's local. But there is another kind of speed in here, which exists here too, okay? If you take a point in here mass, as it's going back and forth, it has its own speed. Same thing in here, if you take a disturbance of string, this point, any given point has its own speed going up and down. So this speed we're not talking about, we're talking about the speed of travel. There are two kinds of speed you have to be careful with. So this speed, both of them have it, and that is not what we talk about. We talk about the, 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 the fact that this disturbance is traveling. This is local. So this is the speed we're talking about in here. Both of them have amplitude too, which is how much you move this one from here or how much this one goes up. So that is actually common to both of them. The wavelength is unique to waves. And uh, frequency is common to both of them. The speed also in this sense is unique to wave, the speed of travel. Not to this local speed or this local speed. So there is up and down speed, which is really not what we care about for the case of a string or the sound, how fast the compressions are happening in that the region. That's not. We're talking about how fast sound travels from one end to the other. That is what we care about. So this is the travel. And because waves travel, they only have speed. The others don't, OK? So those are the two things that are different. Amplitude is common for both of them. Also, you have amplitude in here, too. OK? The, 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 ampli the frequency is used in hertz. I already mentioned that when I was talking about this one. This is actually in gigahertz, OK? So if you look at your phone, this is the unit they use for it. When it says giga, that means 10 to the power 9. And hertz is the unit for, for, uh, for uh, the period, OK? And uh, for the frequency, I'm sorry, how often, how many oscillations would you do up and down in one second, OK? So this is a number, number of oscillations or vibrations in one second. So the unit for it is a number per second. Mr. Hertz did a lot of work on, on, on uh, electromagnetic waves, so they named that unit after him. Okay. Period, on the other hand, is unit, has the units of time exactly. So period is how long it takes for the pattern to repeat. Okay, same thing. So this distance is in time, not in space. So period is in time, which means the unit for it is actually second. So the period and the wavelength are related to some extent. One of them is measured for both of them, which is period, how often the pendulum goes back and forth. So if your pendulum takes the second, you can use it as a clock because every time it goes back and forth, it takes one second. So you can use it for your, uh, for your clock in here to take the seconds. So that can be used as a time device actually because the time that goes back and forth is exactly one second. But also it can be happening also for waves. I know that this, how long does it take for a disturbance to go from one point to the next point? For example, this compression, if I let go of it, how long does it take to move completely to another location? Then in this case, that is actually what the period is, okay? So again, the frequency is, uh, this is a relationship that is famous, okay? between the period and frequency. Frequency and the period are just the inverse of one another. Frequency times the period, no matter what you do to this product, it's always one, because they're the inverse of one another. And the units are actually the inverse of one another. So the period that is in seconds, the frequency is actually in Hertz, which is actually one over seconds. The second cancel the second and it's one. This has no units, the product of these two. It's just one, it's always one, okay, no matter what. The source of all waves is vibrations. That is my point earlier. It's a disturbance, which is really a vibration, local disturbance, but it travels. Okay? Higher frequencies means increased rate of, in, uh, of energy transfer. Okay? So if the frequency of, uh, of a wave is 20 hertz, its period is, of course, 1 20th of a second. So it changes back and forth in 1 20th of a second. So that is what the period is. So if you do that, this is one second. And you start counting, it went one, two, three, four, five, 
six and seven, and you continue doing this until you find 20 of them. So this is 20 Hertz. This whole thing took, 12, it took uh, one second. Now, if you want to know how much time does it take to go up and down, of course, it's going to be one second divided by 20. So it's one twentieth of a second. So the correct answer is this one. Make sense? Come on, guys. I know some of you did not have coffee and it's still early, but I'm hoping good. Good. Thank you, Tanner. Yeah, it makes very sense, enough. Professor. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the wave speed describes how fast the disturbance travels from location to location related to the frequency on the wavelength. As a matter of fact, it's the product of the two. So if you take the wavelength and you multiply it by the frequency, this is the speed of the wave. So if you really care to, to do mathematics, this is how you do this product. Here is the deal. If the speed is fixed, doesn't change. Like for example, for the case of sound, if you increase the frequency, that means the wavelength has to go down. If you decrease the frequency, that means the wavelength has to go longer. So longer wavelength are higher frequencies. Shorter wavelength, I'm sorry, did they say that? Longer wavelength are lower frequencies and shorter wavelength are higher frequencies. Short means it's less. Short wavelength is sh less. That means it's higher frequency. Because when you multiply both of them, you're going to find the speed in this case. Now, if you don't have short wavelength, but you have higher long wavelength, that means that the frequency is low. So that it's the same number, OK? because you want to multiply these two numbers. So if this in, uh, increases, the other one must go down. So this is the relationship between frequency and wavelength. Obviously, this, this only depends if the speed doesn't change. Some cases it does, OK? I already mentioned earlier when I started uh, this class that, for example, the speed of light changes from medium to medium. So in this case, this relationship, you have to be careful with it in here, OK? Because this medium, light travels with the speed of light. And in this medium, it travels with the speed depending on how much refraction you have in here in the medium. So in this case, it's actually traveling lower or slower. So this relationship is true here, yes. So if you change, the, for, for example, the color of light, that means the wavelength has changed because the frequency is really related to the color. In this medium, it's the same relationship because the speed is constant throughout this medium, but the free values are not the same values in here. So you have to be careful with this, uh, this stuff in here provided that the speed does not change. But in the vacuum or in the air, the speed of light is the same. So the, there is a correlation also similar between wavelength and, uh, and period. Here is the example I was talking about, okay? Slinky can do a transverse. Look at the compression in here. 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 This is called compression. This is a rarification. And this is a compression. Obviously, this is where the vibration has been created. And it traveled in this direction and went hit the wall and bounced back. And it's traveling along this length also. OK? So this is a compressional wave or longitudinal waves along the length of the wave. The same slinky, what you do to it, you create a disturbance up and down. So this is up. This is down, up, and down, and up. But in this case, it's the same level. This point, the same level, OK? And this is the same level everywhere in here. So you can follow this and basically describe a similar behavior. The wave is traveling this way still, in the same direction for both of them, except the disturbance is up and down. So this is the case of transverse wave. And this is the case of a longitudinal. And sometimes called compressional wave. 
I hope you know why. Compression or because it's compression and rarification, okay? But actually longitudinal is a better description in this case because it's along the direction of travel. So long, longitudinal. Whereas this one is transverse, it's also implied in the name that it's actually perpendicular. So in this case, it's perpendicular. So that was the same item of discussion to begin with, okay? That we started with today. So the vibration along transverse wave move perpendicular. This is the key in here. Here is sound. Sound is actually a, a, a disturbance that is uh, compressional. So what you do in this case, when you when you press against the air, the air is actually brought in and out, in and out, in and out, and it travels throughout a sphere, actually, immediately next to the source. But as it moves further away and further away, the sphere becomes larger and larger so that it becomes more like a plane. Immediately next to your ear, it's going to be hit by front waves that are planar waves, okay? So this is basically how the behavior of it, too, okay? Usually, we have these tuning forks, and the tuning forks, if you look at them, I don't know if you have access to some or not. We have a lot of them in the lab. Uh, this is a 512. Uh, I don't know if you can read the number or not in there. Maybe if I stop sharing and uh, zoom into this. It's not in focus. It's 512, and it's the note C in the bottom. It tells you exactly what this sound is supposed to be. Because you use these devices for tuning uh, musical instruments also. So let me change in here. Can I do something with the speaker? Audio settings. OK. So I'm going to create a disturbance. And I'm not sure if you can hear it or not. Oh, it's clear now. It's 512C. Did you guys hear it? Not the first one, okay? Okay, at least Tanner heard it. It decays after that. So this is the note C, the 500, good. That is the 512 Hertz. So this number that you see in here is actually in Hertz. So if you're curious trying to find out how often this goes up and down, it's one over 512 seconds, okay? It goes 512 up and down in one second. So that is the sound that you hear. We humans are conditioned to hear only certain frequencies below the threshold we can hear. Some animals like, for example, whales and elephants and things like that, they can hear frequencies below our range. Some other animals, they can hear frequencies higher than the 20,000 frequency that we theoretically can hear. And that is, for example, for bats and other animals, for example, they use that for their communications and actually for uh, instead of their eyesight to, to, to move along. So this sound is very, very important for in the animal kingdom. And it's not just for the humans to hear sounds. There are sounds that a dog, for example, hears that we can't hear and uh, the vice versa, OK? And actually, it also changes with age. There are some sounds that young people can hear because of the high frequencies but because the ear starts to deteriorate after a while that we do not hear it as much when you get older. And this was used actually in some technologies, for example, because some kids, for example, they go and play in front of businesses and those businesses are supposed to cater to certain age groups. So what they do in this case, they produce some very annoying, super high frequency frequencies that the customers, the proper generation do not hear, but the young, kids who play there with their skateboard and everything else, they hear it and they are annoyed with it so much that they move away. So you produce those high pitch frequencies at very high intensity, but if you are a customer who's supposed to be on that age group, you're not gonna hear anything, you're just walking in. But if there's somebody who's got that trying to play in front of that store and create disturbances there for the customers, they're basically out of luck. So again, sound is a compressional wave, okay? And this is an example of that, okay? So let's continue with this discussion. Sound travel with a number of 340 meters per second. So bullets, usually they tra travel less than 300 meters per second, around 300 
Jets also can do probably 300 meter per second. I mean, the cruise liners, that is, okay? Super fast ones, others they move slower. But some military airplanes actually can move faster than this speed, and those are the supersonics, okay? There was a, uh, they made some planes in the old days between France and uh, Britain that were supersonic, but they basically, uh, they don't use them anymore. No, all travel, all basically uh, commercial airlines, they use subsonic basically planes. So again, a person attending a concert broadcast over the radio sitting at 45 meters from the stage. The person listens to the radio broadcast with a transistor radio over one ear and the non-broadcast sound signal with the other ear. Further, suppose that, suppose that the radio signal must travel the entire around the earth reaching the person. Which signal? What is, now, it depends on the speed of light because speed of light is 300,000 kilometers per second. Okay. And the distance is 45 meters. So you can calculate the speed in here and you can calculate because the other one, the other one, the one that is here hearing through his or her radio is that it's going through the microphone and it's being amplified somewhere in here or actually, I'm sorry, uh, modulated in here and then sent through a, 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 uh, to the broadcasting station and the broadcasting station sends it to the, the, to the satellite and the satellite will come in here to another receiver that is going to rebroadcast the signal that is captured by this antenna that is super weak signal at that point amplified by the radio and comes to his ear, okay? Because then those oscillations are coming through a speaker and that speaker moves back and forth that is going to produce the sound immediately next to his or her ear in here. Whereas the sound also can travel through the medium, in this case, the air in the room straight to his other ear. Okay? If you do the calculations, they will arrive at the same time. Because part of the other signal is actually electronic signal. And also in here from the antenna down to his ear, it's actually electronic. And the other one actually is to the broadcasting station, to the satellite that captures it and then rebroadcasts it. This is actually light waves then light waves again, and then there is another re re uh, demodulation and uh, actually not demodulation, rebroadcast and amplification in here by the uh, by the, the broadcasting tower next to him. That is going to send a signal to here. <sighs> a long work just to get some music in here. And since he's in the musical hall, why can't he enjoy that? Okay, maybe with a little bit of amplifier, and he's going to have his music directly from the source. Okay, so. Again, I was talking about speakers. So loudspeakers, what they use in this case, they use actually capacitors and some electronic devices that change back and forth with the electricity. So the frequency in this case is an electrical signal that is proportional to the source that made it. And then it's going to move the drum in here, in this case, back and forth. And that is going to produce the same sound as it receives from the electricity in this case, hence making the signal for you, okay? So again, you can make your own if you like, okay, with the wavelength. So again, for each increase, the, the sound depends also on temperature, okay? And that is a phenomenon because town travels actually with a phenomenon of something called, has to do with heat, how much heat is exchanged. Sound travel without heat exchange, okay? So the temperature may be different and this is what causes sound to change, sound speed to change with, uh, with temperature. Actually, and after actually it travels also with different media with different speeds, meaning that in, in air, this is the speed of sound. But in solids, for example, in a piece of iron, sound, sound travel faster. So what you do in this case, you could go to, for example, the train station. And even if you don't see the train and you don't hear it in the air that it's coming, you can just put your ear on the, on the, on the, on the tracks and you actually can hear the rumbling of the train. Okay. So that is one way of telling, don't stick your ear too long in there because the train is coming, okay? It's gonna be not a pretty picture afterwards. I already mentioned the fact that the reflection, how waves reflect. I already talked about the fact that the, uh, the uh, uh, how images are formed in front of a flat mirror, but also in the case of sound in a place, there is the echo, okay? The echo is actually a reflection of sound. So you could hear sound coming from different sources for you in here, in this case, depending on which way it bounces. And that is something that you can experience in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, 
in the outside also actually when they're reflecting mountains and valleys and things like that. The law of reflection, which is true also for light or any wave, is that the angle of incidence is the same as the angle of reflection. So what do they talk about mathematicians or physicists when they do this expression is the following. If they take this as the normal to the surface, this is the incoming wave. This is the angle of reflect uh, incidence, okay? This is this angle. And this is the angle of reflection. That is the one that is causing the image actually to form. That is what tells you what the image forms on the other side. And these two angles must be the same. And it's true also here too. And it's true here too, albeit this is wider angle, so is this one. So it's true everywhere. So this is the mathematical expression that physicists use to find which way the reflected waves move depending on which way the, the incident wave, wave comes in, okay? So this is true for all waves, okay? Uh, diffusion is when you have imperfections in the surface of contact. And here I'm assuming that the surface is perfectly smooth in here. When there is imperfections, it's still the law of incidence is equal, is applicable in this case, but the surface itself is not smooth. That's why the reflected wave is not uniformly going in all the same direction. As a matter of fact, it's go, this one is going this way, whereas this one is going the opposite way. And these angles are still the same true everywhere. And this one is actually deflected in here and the other one. So in this case, sound is going every which way. And this is true for all waves. So when you send light on a, on a, on a, on a, on a non-smooth surface, you're going to have light that is basically becomes fuzzy. The picture is not good because the image that is forming is coming from a lot of directions. And for example, if you're looking at a, uh, the hand, for example, from the other side, when it combines in your eye, it gives you so many different superposition of waves. And now you have a fuzzy picture, non-focused picture. Okay, because the surface is not smooth. That's why all mirrors have this perfect surface on them, or at least as close as possible from it. Okay, again, I talked about the reflection in this case for the case, this is the case of light. And uh, the fact that the angle of incidence in here, this is the angle of incidence, is bigger than the angle of uh, refraction in this case, because of the fact that light in this case travels slower in here than in this case. And this is true for all waves too. Water waves do this phenomenon when it, they travel from medium to medium. Sound waves also do that. And the pitch actually changes from medium to medium. And that is why if you hear sound coming through the wall, so for example, it's not kind of the same as coming from the air. The tone changes, the, 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 the frequency itself is not the same. And this is actually also depending on the temperature. So you have the phenomenon of, uh, of how light is reflected. This is actually what leads to mirage and some other things. So, okay. This I mentioned already a few animals that use sound for their navigation. Dolphins are some of them, they send sound depending on how it reflects back to them. They can tell the size of the object, they can tell the density of the object, they can make an image of it in their ears, basically in their brains, uh, not their ears, okay? So they can, that's how bats do too. And they never get super fast and they rarely collide with one another because, or they have the walls or anything like that because of the laws of reflection. So bats and dolphins and all of these animals seem to be proficient in this laws of reflection and refraction. Again, forced vibration setting up for vibrations if in an object by vibration. So basically, if you have a leaf, for example, if you have a bridge or if you have something in this case and you sustain it by wind, for example, then in this case, it's forced oscillation, okay? When the two frequencies, the natural frequency of an object and the forcing uh, object of frequency in this case, they match, you have in this case uh, resonance. And resonance in here can cause violent uh, 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 disturbances. If you Google, and this is part of the stuff that you're going to do, this is the second item for the for uh, the discussion. Okay, item two. So I want you really guys to focus on these two items of discussion today, because I'm going to really be picky on these two ones in here. Okay, so we're going to Google or search the Tacoma Bridge and other examples of resonance. 
okay? So the, how, what happened at Tacoma Bridge when FTX was built and the engineers did not really do their homework properly in a sense that they did not note that the frequency, the natural frequency of the bridge can be excited by uh, uh, the winds and it was. So the bridge started oscillating violently and, and, and broke down. So from this point on, engineers and scientists and all of that, they paid very much detail to this phenomenon when they are building their devices. Resonance can be a positive thing or a negative thing. A negative thing in this case, okay? This is bad. You need to avoid it as much as possible. A positive thing, for example, in tuning devices. Tuning and other kinds of things. So we really want resonance in this case. So for example, the dial on your on your on your on your radio need to be pre produce an internal frequency that match the broadcasting station frequency so that they will be in sync, they will be in resonance so that your electronic device amplifies it. And now you have a good reception of that signal. Because there are so many broadcasting stations, but you don't care for all of them, you just care for one. So you change your frequency your internal frequency of the of radio, for example, to match that of the station that you want to receive. So in this case, they're in sync, they're in resonance. So you're going to focus only on that frequency, but all of the other stations are broadcasting at the same time. And this is true for all of them. So that is basically why it can be a positive. It's very important, actually, okay? Did everybody get these two items of discussion today? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, very good. So again, this is basically the phenomenon of verification and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, compression, where uh, through the tuning fork that I demoed earlier, and this is actually the Tacoma Bridge itself. Okay. But again, the item has more than that, okay? So we're going to explore more on resonance in here, other examples of uh, resonance, and talk specifically about the good and the bad, okay? So this is the Tacoma Bridge. Interference is unique to waves, and this is the signature of a wave. So if you see interference, you know you're dealing with waves. This is a typical behavior of surface waves, for example, for water, okay? And this is the two types of, 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 of interference, okay? So the intensity was this much, or the amplitude was this much. Now the amplitude is twice as much in here, and uh, the trough was this much in this case, now it's this much, so it has increased a lot. So this is a reinforcement or constructive interference. So this is this type. When they are out of sync, when they are out of phase, this one is maxing when the other one is minimum, and this one is maxing when the other one is minimum. So in this case, when they meet, they cancel one another. In this case, it's a destructive interference. So this is actually an important technology if you want to, for example, shield your, 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 your receiver, for example, from other places. So you can produce the same frequency as the broadcasting agency or the broadcasting place, but out of phase. So that when the other one maxes, yours is min and vice versa. So that when they meet in the receiver, where you don't want the signal to be uh, uh, to be captured at all, you want complete cancellation or destruction, okay? So this is actually good spy technology, okay? This is actually important also if you want to amplify signal. So this is actually very important too. So both of them are important, and that is unique to waves. Particles do not do that. So if a particle meets another particle, you still have two particles. But in this case, both of them are lost in the process, and now you have a new one, where you can see the details of one or the other in here. Actually, in here, you have nothing. You don't even have the original waves. At all. They do, they're gone, OK? And this is expressed in this phenomenon here by the intensity of an individual one is just value, but in some places it's actually amplified and in some places it's missing, okay? It's missing in there. That is actually destructive interference and constructive interference in the same place, same time, okay? So again, this are for the case of 
uh, 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 the source, I mean, one wave and another wave, and it's constructive interference clearly in here. Again, you have them in sync in here. You have one wave and another wave and give you a stronger one because it's constructive. And in this case, it's destructive. They're completely out of this phase. When this one is max, the other one is min and vice versa. So now they cancel each other completely. And the same thing in here, when this one is actually compressional, the other one is actually a rarification and vice versa. So when they meet, they have nothing. The sound is gone in here, okay? So again, these are questions related to that. Interference and applications, again, sound interference, noisy, noisy devices such so jackhammers are equipped with microphones to produce micro image wave patterns fed to operate earphone cancellations. So this is used in the earphone cancellations. So that's for the operator not to be bothered with that one. So they know the frequency of their device, or at least they have it already gauged. So they want to produce a counterpart signal so that this max is canceled with this min and vice versa where this is max, the other one is min. So that when you add them up is a lot less noise for you, okay? For the cancellations, for example, for the noise cancellations on the, on the, on the planes, they also use similar technology, but they have a rough idea of what that signal is. So you can at least sit comfortably in a plane. Again, you can bring two devices in here and you can have them attenuated or amplified depending on how you have in there. Beats is another phenomenon. Beats is actually when you have two frequencies that are close from one another, but not equal. So you hear hum in this case when you add them up. So you hear the frequency of one or the other, which is very close from one another. So you're gonna hear that frequency, but you're gonna hear another frequency that is coming from the difference of the two, beat, two beats. So there is another period which is a little longer. So it's actually a lower frequency in this case that you're going to capture in addition to the high frequency of the signal. This is usually actually used for musical uh, devices tuning. So what you do in this case, you know the C note is supposed to be 512. You know, a guitar instrument, for example, if you hit it at a certain one of them is supposed to pre produce the C note, okay? If you're a trained musician and you know exactly what the sound is supposed to sound like, you hit the note and in the same time, you, you produce a sound on the musical instrument. I know nowadays the, the tuning is done electronically, talking about the old, basically, uh, devices that require mechanical motion. So in this case, you hear, if you're a trained musician, that there is a slight difference between the two frequencies it's expressed in terms of this hum. So what you do in this case, you change the tension. There is a tensioner on all of the musical instruments, whether it's a piano or a, or a guitar or anything like that. You change the tensioner, you make it ten more tense, and you produce the sound. Did, did the, the beat frequency, did the, the hum go away, or actually has been worse in a sense how you hear it more often? So in this case, if you hear it more often, that means you tensioned it more than it should be. And you should have loosened it, actually. So you go into the opposite direction, and you loosen it a little, and now you produce. Did it go away? If it went away completely, now you're good. If it did not, but it went less than before, you keep on reducing or changing it up and down until you come up with the musical device properly tuned in this case. So it produces the notes that it's supposed to produce when it's supposed to produce them. So you go about doing your, your musical number. So again, it's used for this one. It's used in all kinds of other applications too, when you have beats where two frequencies are close from one another, but not exactly equal. Okay, when they're exactly equal, they cannot make a difference between the two of them. Here is an example in here of two sources in this case. So this is perfectly in tune, but this one is clearly uh, uh, out of phase in here. So this is going to produce a sound that is slightly different for both of them. And that is where the beat frequency comes up in. Now, this is where standing waves also is another phenomenon in here to, uh, uh, in regard to uh, wave uh, creations. So when you have a, a disturbance on one side on the string, for example, and it hits the other side, and let's say, for example, the other side is fixed so that now you have a node on one side and node on the other side, you can actually excite certain frequencies and only frequencies that depend on the length of the instrument only, okay? Which is very good. I mean, if you're going to be a musician and you would want to only get some phases only involved, okay? So in this case, you have one anti node and two nodes. In this case, you have two anti nodes and three nodes. This is one, two, and three. In this case, you have one node, 
where the string is not moving, basically. That is where the disturbance is created. And you have another node that's two, and you have a third node that's three, and you have a fourth node that is four nodes. Whereas for, uh, for each number of uh, nodes, you always just subtract one to get how many empty nodes he has, how many tummies that is. So in this case, you have four nodes, therefore you have four minus one empty nodes. And here they are, one, two, and three. Here, I have three nodes, one, two, and three. Therefore, I have three minus one empty nodes, which means I have two tummies in this case, one and two. And in this case, I have two nodes, so I must have two minus one empty nodes, and here it is, okay? So if you have seven nodes, so you can figure out how many empty nodes you have. Seven minus one, so it's gonna be six empty nodes, okay? So this is basically standing waves. And again, this happens because you are creating a disturbance on this side, when it hits this one, it's fixed, so it's going to reverse and come back. And now you're actually adding two waves with the same frequency, but completely out of phase. So in this case, if the length is just the right length, you can produce these standing waves. Otherwise, you would produce a mass in here that does not correspond to any number of musical instrument that you're going to enjoy. It's going to be noise, really, okay? Just to prove the fact that this has to do with the, so I'm gonna do the musical instrument in here anyway, okay? So what I have in here, so you're gonna go to here, this is my musical number by the way, okay? That I take the show with me everywhere. So what you have in here, you have a, just a, uh, what you call a straw, okay? So what I'm going to do in here, I'm going to produce sharp sound. So I'm going to make an edge to it in here on one side. And because the length, as you can clearly see, is very long in here. So the frequency is going to be very, very low pitch. And you're going to hear it as if some big elephant passing by in here, OK? So let's hear. Did everybody hear the sound? Yes? Okay, so I'm going to change the length and to show that indeed that indeed the frequency is going to be higher and higher as I was talking about about the standing wave. So what you going on in here, this is not similar to the string that I was showing because this side is open. So it's like a string that is completely free in this case for sound, okay? So again, Yeah, we can barely hear it. You can't. Yeah, the higher the higher the frequent the higher the pitch, we can we can barely hear it. <laughs> the higher it goes. Yeah, but there is a different change in the tone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, our ears can't really hear it when it goes really high. <laughs> Oh man, sorry about that. We, we need to. <laughs> okay. So that is about the age of our age, too. Okay, anyway. Hope you guys, that was fun. Okay. And uh, when I did this actually in class, my students take videos of this and enjoy it and record it. And <laughs> okay, so let's continue with standing waves. So this is standing waves. So what you saw actually were standing waves. With this demo okay should i quit my job and become a musician what do you guys think can i bring crowd i'd pay to see that what did you say daniel i said i'd pay to see you you play your music your music <laughs> okay thank you That's that incredible. makes two of us <laughs> okay, so again, the Doppler effect, I already mentioned the fact that you have three things going on for you, okay? You have an observer, a listener, a receiver, however you want to call it, 
then you have a source. So the observer can move in or out, can move toward, forward, toward, or away, toward or recede, okay? The source also can move in or out, okay? And the wave is actually has its own speed. That's the third one in two. So the wave actually is moving too. So the phenomenon of this Doppler effect is the following, basically. If the net motion, the net, is an approach or forward between the source and the observer, the frequency is going to go higher, higher pitch for sound. And that you can tell just by seeing at an emergency vehicle, ambulance or whatever, okay? If the net motion is receding, so this is the frequency is going to be higher. This is the frequency perceived is going to be lower. It's perceived, it's not real. So the source in here has its own frequency. So if you sit still and the source sits still, that is the natural frequency with which it's coming. Okay, so it doesn't change really. So what matters in this case is the source. This can be an important device. This is actually what police officers use for a radar gun to, to, to measure your speed. Because as the police officer is moving or stationary, it doesn't matter, this device can tell him exactly your speed just by basically pointing the radar gun in there to your, your direction and pick up the, the difference in frequency pitch and the sound and the device actually will do the calculation for him or her and then give them how, how much speed you're moving just by doing these calculations and they give you a ticket for it. So this can be used there for that technology. It's used actually for other phenomenon too. For example, for measuring how fast stars are moving in and out, for example, if they are moving in orbit, because we can use actually light also, if the light is shifting toward the blue, that means the star is coming towards us. If the light is shifting toward the red, because the red is actually has lower frequency than the blue. We're gonna talk about this one next time around, okay? So if the light is moving this way, that means the object is coming closer. If the light is moving this way toward the red, that means we know the right of the frequency, for example, the frequency is supposed to be here, but when we measure it, we find it here. So then in this case, we know that it has mo it's moving further away from us and vice versa and here it's moving towards us, okay? So that is how this phenomenon is. And it all has to do with the, with the, with the apparent wavelength in here, okay? So for example, as the source, produces its wavelengths, the wave fronts in here, that means the crests, for example, they're spaced equally by the wavelength. So the distance between a crest and a crest is actually the wavelength lambda. But in this situation, if you are observer B, the source sends its signal and moves towards you and sends another signal and moves towards you and sends another signal by the time it has here. So the, the, the apparent wave, because it sends one and moves towards you. So the distance between the first one that was sent earlier and this one that is just sent now is just this distance because it's already covered by some, by the moving uh, uh, source. So in this case, you're, you receive them at a shorter distances. And if you go a few slides back, shorter frequency means higher, I mean, a, sh a shorter wavelength means, uh, means higher frequency. Where is that slide? A long, long time ago. Did it, was it here? No. Was it here? Yes. So the distance appears to be shorter and shorter for the way for you, you interpret it's moving at a higher and higher frequency. So now the sound changes in your ear. Okay, Your brain interprets it as a different signal, whereas it's a different one because it knows what that frequency needs to sound like. So for you, you look at this distance, between the crust and the crest, and you see it shorter and shorter, for, you associate with it higher and higher frequency. Whereas for observer A, it sends a signal and moves away from it. So the next time it sends another one, another way front, the distance between the two fronts is larger, so it's bigger. So for this guy, the, the wavelength appears longer and longer. So in this case, it appears to be low, lower and lower frequencies, meaning that the tone is changing. So that is what the Doppler effect is coming from. It's coming from that. So if you're sitting in the middle in here, obviously this is coming towards you. So if it's coming towards you, the wave fronts are compressed. 
which means that for you, sound is actually has a higher pitch for this one. And you can tell, even if you are blindfolded, that one of them is coming to your left. And this one is actually moving away from you because of the fact that you hear the sound spaced out, the wavefronts are spaced out. So that means that uh, the frequency is lower and lower. So this is moving away, this is coming closer. Okay, the bow wave or actually this uh, supersonic wave is when the source actually moves faster than the, than, than the speed of sound. So it sends one, it sends another, it sends the third one and they are piling up in a wave front by the time, if you're sitting in here, the plane has moved. This is what, when it was immediately above your head, it has moved in here. By the time this reaches you, there is a pile up of wave fronts, tremendous energy that builds up and that would create that boom, okay? This produces a cone, actually, it's called the sonic boom, uh, uh, the sonic cone, okay? And that cone has to do with how fast the source is moving with how fast the sound is moving, okay? So the sound actually traveled this way for you and the plane has moved all the way there. And this ratio, this angle depends on the ratio of these two velocities, okay? If it moves right neck there, so actually there is a buildup in front of it too. And that can cause damages to the plane. So right at the transition, you don't want it to have too long for a, for a plane because initially that can cause a lot of damage to the plane. Actually, a lot of people died when they were experimenting with the planes at the beginning, in the beginning, okay? Again, this is V less than VW. That means uh, the, the wave in this case is moving faster. So the wave fronts, they are compressed, but not piling up. This is exactly equal to, so the wave front is actually piling up in front of the source itself. And now it's moving faster and in here greatly faster. So in this case, the, the wave fronts, they don't pile up unless you're very far away from it. Okay, so this is where the boom is going to have the greatest because they pile up right next to it too. Okay, it's actually a uh, uh, it's actually a uh, cone, not a uh, not a uh, <clears throat> not a two dimensional shape as it looks like as it appears to be look like this. It's actually a three dimensional shape. And I was talking about this angle in there, and this is basically the two wave fronts that are coming. That's what you hear from the tail and the front, and that's what you're actually going to have in your uh, the signal that is detected okay this is the shock wave that is associated with the with that motion okay musical instruments again a perfectly tuned or actually a good musical instrument has this frequencies noise has all kinds of frequencies in it so in this in the devices like this one they have proper frequencies and you work very hard to have them tuned and this is basically the harmonics that are produced this is exactly the same thing what i was talking about the 512 no t is associated with specific harmonic, for example, if you're doing it on a string or actually on piano, okay? And these are the number of notes. And here I have one, two, three, four, five notes. And in this case, I have, I should have four empty notes. I have one, two, three, and four. Those are empty notes, okay? This is again, sending waves. So if you have the device properly tuned, you're going to have that. So, but different devices will have actually different frequencies if you analyze them properly. For example, both of them are supposed to be the C note, and each and every one of them has its own C signal. As a matter of fact, no two clarinets will have the same uh, uh, wave pattern. Okay, there was always a kind of fluctuations when you do a. This is something called in, in mathematics Fourier analysis to see the exact components in terms of the individual frequencies. Anyway, this is the entire chapter. Remember, you have two items for the discussion. I will see you guys on Wednesday, on Wednesday, sorry, on Thursday at the same time, okay? Good? Okay, very good, thank you. Let me stop recording then.